uh, we're asking the question, what is genuine faith? What is genuine faith? Now, I don't expect you to remember the whole journey that we've been on any more than I expect you to remember everything you ate for lunch this past week. All right? You might remember one or two things, but you know that right? And so by being here, you're being fed. And there will be those things that will stick with us, but some things are just going to nourish us and feed us uh, in the interim, uh, in, you know, and then we're going to have to come and eat again. But uh, if you want to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start in verses 6 through 9 today. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And we're looking at this question, what is genuine faith? Okay. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by the fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see See him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we're going to start answering this question, uh, what is genuine faith? What is it that, that makes it sincere, authentic, genuine? And I, I just couldn't think of a better passage than this one. And we're going to see these four aspects here that are, are ingredients or elements or the DNA of genuine faith as brought out in uh, by Peter here. And in uh, just kind of going through these verses. And in verse 6, he said that genuine faith is proved by testing. Genuine faith is proved by testing. Now, sometimes that's the part that we don't want to hear too much, is it? But if you have faith, and if you say you believe God for something, it will be tested. It might be tested a little bit or a lot. I look at it, I, I say it like this. There are daily quizzes, and then sometimes there's a big exam. <laughs> but ultimately, there's going to be the final exam. Amen? And the final exam is if you your trust in Jesus, if you put your faith in Jesus. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, th this comes up in various places. Yes, God loves everybody. Can you say amen to that? God loves... I don't care. I think... Do you know that God loved Adolf Hitler? Amen, right? And Jesus did everything that he could to save Adolf, Adolf Hitler from eternal hell. But Adolf Hitler chose not to love Jesus back. And even though God loves everybody, God's deliverance is accessed through faith. It's through choosing to put my faith in the fact that God loves me. That's how it comes. Now, if I choose not to believe God loves me, then I'm choosing not to put my faith in God. It's as simple as that. God loves everybody, but we access His love through faith. Now, He'll still be merciful and He'll love us, but it's our faith when we put it in Him uh, that, that proves that. And, and it, there's going to be testing. Let me come back to this point real quick. It's going to be proved by testing. There's no other way around it. So... I say I believe something. I may even believe that I believe something. But until that's actually been through the fire, I don't know if it's real or not. And sometimes we're afraid of going through the fire and going through the testing. But in reality, it's a good thing because it can declutter our lives. It can help us to let go of all the stuff that we don't really uh, believe, that we, that we say that, that we do. So it's proved by testing, uh, and, and there are the little quizzes, the bigger quizzes, and ultimately the final exam. There's just no way around that. We're going to kind of keep pounding away at this uh, aspect of it a little bit more whoops, as we go through here, because it also says that it's more precious than gold. Now, you know, we're just getting back from Texas this past week, and uh, I don't know about Texas. Texas, but a lot of the western states had gold, a gold rush in their history. That They were populated so quickly because people wanted to get to the gold. They wanted to get out there. And a lot of people's hopes were devastated because a fool's gold. <laughs> and they became the fool instead of becoming the victor because what they left everything for and went after was fool's gold. But there's a very simple test to know if it's real gold or if it's fool's gold. 
I should have known this younger because then maybe I got rid of a bunch of gold and didn't know it. But if you want to know the test, you hit it with a hammer. Really, you do. Because fool's gold will shatter and break, but real gold will bend. So if someone tries to sell you a gold nugget or they try to sell you, I don't know if the jeweler will let you do that with the gold ring or not, but, but if you hit it, it'll crack or it'll break, even shatter if it's fool's gold, but genuine gold will bend, but it won't break. I think that says a lot. I don't know that they knew the science of that when Peter wrote this, but the Holy Spirit knew, and he wrote under the inspiration, and he said, he, he said, your genuine faith is more precious than gold. What am I saying? I'm saying that though we don't like the testing, that when we're tested, we find out after a while that if we're really trusting God, we bend, but we don't break. Are you following me? Are you with me here? It's got to be tested. Now, um, the Lord, ha I, I honestly believe that it's a word from the Lord that this church is going to grow. And what I'm hanging my hopes on is not church growth. It's on spiritual growth and spiritual maturity and souls coming into the kingdom and all of that. And the thing is, though, if I want that to be tested, if we want that to be tested, you know what we're going to have to do? We're going to have to, on days like day, today when it looks a little lower, we're going to have to be saying, hey, this church is going to grow. This church is going to grow because it has to be tested, see? If we really believe this, if we're really going to walk through this. And uh, when some people choose to depart from us, we love them. But we have to say, well, God said the church is going to grow. So we're just going to believe God. We're going to love people in. We're going to love people out. Uh, we're just going to, again, we, that, it is access through faith, but we just love everybody. And that's just the truth. We will just love everybody, whether they come or whether they go. But what did God say? Now, and again, I've said this several times. When I say that God said the church is going to grow, and I believe that, and that's why I'm proclaiming claiming that, that's great, but I need to put that on a more firm foundation. And the more firm foundation is that God spoke to us that he was gathering laborers in this place. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So what I'm building on the foundation is not my idea that the church will grow. I'm building on the foundation that God said the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, gather har grab yeah, I, can, I can talk really, gather laborers. So you may not see it, but coming in, I'm seeing it, how the Lord is gathering laborers. As, as we're finding projects to do, like on church work days, there are people saying that they can help with stuff. You know, there are people that are helping with prayer. There are people that are helping with uh, organizing various aspects of what we're doing. There are people that are helping with cleaning. We're gathering labor. That's what we're doing. And we're building on that word on a firm foundation, and we're going to see things grow. It's not my, my job to determine how it's going to be tested or how it's going to happen. But if we believe it and believe God, it's going to grow. But it has to be tested. It has to be. You know, uh, someone might come in and say, you know, Pastor Dave, we would really like our church to combine with your church. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, you could double in a week, Pastor David. But you need to understand that, that, that we do believe that homosexuals can be ordained in the ministry. Guess what's going to happen? It's not going to happen, is it? It's not. Do we love them? Absolutely, we love them, but it's not going to happen. And we're just going to have to say, okay, God, we're going to believe you to bring it another way because we're going to just trust you, Lord. And, but it has to be tested. And now here's the thing. When your faith is tested, oh, dear Lord, when it gets tested, what happens is it becomes to you, not just to the Lord, it becomes to you more precious than gold. Watch what happens here. Now, listen. Let's suppose you've had some problems in, in your health and in your body, but you've just stood and you've just believed God. God, you're going to touch me. You're going to heal me. I'm going to speak it. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to stand on the word. You're going to heal me, God. I just believe it. And, you know, people are saying, look like you got one leg in the grave. I don't want to make you feel bad, but, you know, it's not what I'm seeing here. You look like you're going downhill, but you just believe in God. I'm just going to trust God. And then, however it comes, your healing does come. And you got your bragging rights, your faith bragging rights. Now, once that happens, do you let go of that easy? No way. No way, because that's precious to you. You, this guy doesn't understand the fire that you went through to be where you're at today. 
Are you following me? And that's why, that's why you hold on to that. That's why you're so adamantly uh, holding on to it. It's just like when you get saved, you know, and, and people, they don't get it. They don't really understand why that, but, but you know what God brought you through to get you there. The test that you had to go through. And so it makes it the most precious currency in your life because you know what it costs, even if no one else sees it. You know what it costs. <laughs> Come on, somebody. See, uh, may I never forget it. Uh, sometimes people think, boy, you know, that church doesn't look very big. Why is Pastor Dave so excited about serving at, the, at, at this church? Listen, because I know what I went through to get here. <laughs> and you know what you went through to get here. Amen? Are you with me? So, you know, someone may walk in and say, well, I don't know what the big deal is. You know, 30 people or what? whatever we got there today. But for you, you're walking in. You know what you went through for the 30 people to be here today. So it's precious. So you want to guard it. You want to hold on to it. It's more precious to you than gold. Are you following me? But you don't get that without the testing. You don't get it without the testing. And we all know that. Have you ever looked back on your life and look at the things that you got rid of and you're like, man, I wish I understood the value of those. <laughs> Man, I remember living up in North Dakota, uh, and my dad gave us a little fishing boat that we a few times, it was a nice little little puddle hopper, I called it, that we a few times put it in the little lakes. It wouldn't handle the big lake. We loved it, though, and a few times used it. We moved from North Dakota to Southern Indiana, and I thought, I can't bring this along with me. I just need to sell this boat. I don't think he was real happy that I did either. So, uh, so we just sold it, and the money was useful to us during that time. But then I look back, all the, I keep looking back saying, God, why didn't I keep that little boat? All the times in life, that little puddle hopper would have been so nice just to go put it in a lake on a day off or something like that. But at that time, I didn't realize the value of it. See? Now, I'm going to tell you, if the Lord blesses me with a little puddle hopper now, it's not really something I'm seeking, but if He blesses me with it now, what's going to happen is I'm going to value it a lot more. After the years that have gone by not having that one, are you following me here? This is what happens when your faith is tested. It, when, if it's real, okay, if, if it's not real, you get to unload it. Thank God that I can move on to something and I don't have to carry a weight that's not mine to bear. But if it is real, you realize that it's more precious than gold. And I'm not going to let it go. I'm going to hold on to this. And so there's a story of a man called John Reed. You might have heard this before. But in 1802, he sold his doorstop. After it, it had sat there three years, keeping his door open, he sold it to a local jewelry shop who collected rocks and stuff like that for about $3.50, still pretty good in 1802. But then he found out later that it was a 17-pound gold nugget, one of the biggest ones ever found even to this day. And in that day, it would have been worth $4,000. That's in 1802, imagine $4,000. Today, it would have been worth well over half a million dollars. Today, he just didn't know what he had. <laughs> Check your doorstop, right? You don't know what you have. But, but the people who knew how to test it and understand it, they knew what it was. They saw the value in it. You see, so often we forget the value in what God has given us. Yes, there will be tests in your life. There will be tests in your family. There will be tests in your marriage. There will be tests in your finances. There will be tests in your health. Everyone on some level is going to have all of them, but some people are going to have heavier tests on some area than another area. But when you realize the value of what God gives you, then when you come out of those things and are still standing in faith, you're not going to let go of them easy. Recognize the value of it. You see, that, that's, Lord, teach us to recognize the value of what you've given us. That was the problem with Esau, wasn't it? He came in from the field and oh, he was just so hungry. I'll just give you my birthright. Just make me some soup to eat. Well, I know he was hungry, and I know he was working, and he had to be real hungry for that. But look, you need to understand that he also didn't understand the value of the birthright. Because when he did that, when, when, when he did that, 
when, when Isaac, I'm trying to, to, uh, to wrap my mind around how to express this. They were prosperous, but it was not anywhere on the level of what God had said that it would be. Are you understanding this? It, it, so, uh, um, if someone comes in here and uh, let, let's suppose by the grace of God, by the grace of God, let's suppose that Christmas comes around this year and there's 50 people sitting in here most weeks. I don't know. I'm just throwing out a number. There's 50 people sitting in here uh, most weeks and, and you come in and you think, wow, you know, that's so wonderful what the Lord has done. It's just so marvelous what he's done. Uh, but, but I'll tell you what. I'll give that up. Now, I'm not criticizing. You need to understand the spirit of what I'm saying. I'm not criticizing. I know God moves people around. But I'm going to give that up because, you know, the, the big church in North Canton. I don't know what it is. But the big church in North Canton, you know, uh, boy, I really like all the programs that they have and everything that they have. And, and I just want to go up there instead because it's a lot easier to go there. But you don't understand because you're looking at, yeah, it's prospered a little bit. But if you understood how this church is going to touch the world, you wouldn't trade your birthright over it. Do you understand that? Esau knew that he was blessed, but he didn't understand that God was not just going to bless the encampment, but God was going to bless the nations, the world, the whole earth for time and eternity. He knew Abraham, but he didn't know Abraham as the father of our faith. He didn't know Abraham as not just Christianity. Think about it. Judaism, uh, Islam. Abraham's the father of faith in all of those religions. I know Christianity is the truth. But I'm saying all of those religions look back to Abraham. You see, uh, Esau didn't understand the magnitude of Grandpa. He didn't understand the magnitude of what was happening. But it's only when your faith is tested that you begin to realize those things. Now, a genuine faith, it says up there, loves, believes, and rejoices in Christ, though we do not see Him now. That's what the verse says. Though we don't, don't see Him uh, now. So, one of the ways that we know our faith is genuine is that it's already rejoicing, even before we see it. We're all, it's already, we're just already believing God for it. I, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying there won't be a low spot. I'm not saying there won't be some doubts at times. That's not what I'm getting after. What I'm getting after is that really in, in your knower, right down here in your heart of hearts, you just know this thing ain't done yet. You just know God's doing something and I just can't let go of that hope that's within me. There's a rejoicing and there's a hope that's within me that I just can't let go of it. And that's what genuine faith does. That's one of the elements of a genuine faith is that regardless of the circumstance it, 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 it's, it's there so I'll tell you I know that God called me to ministry I really do I mean I know it I knew it when I was 17 years old really I probably knew it before that but when I was 17 I knew that I was I just knew it that I was called to ministry and really that's only been that's been my life's pursuit since then uh, I went through a really dark period where I tried to get out and it didn't go well but God was merciful and God brought me back I mean you need I'm, I'm sharing this for you with you for a reason now see I, and I hope that you'll get this so uh, I love the assemblies and they're good people and I'm not putting the assemblies down but but I went to two assembly God Bible colleges pastored three assembly God churches I think it was two or three I don't want to take time to mentally calculate it right now my last church was an assistant pastor at a big assembly of god church um and when we left it just watched all that flush down the toilet now i know people that have left a lot a lot less than what we left and they never recovered from it we did go through a hard time but there's a weird thing that happened call it weird that while we were out another organization that I didn't even seek it another pastor in the next town you might meet him someday if he ever gets up this way he uh, he, he kind of took me under his wing during that difficult time and that other that other denomination grace fellowship it was called and there's different ones different grace fellowships but I didn't really even seek it but the apostle over that organization he said you know what you were ordained in the assemblies we're going to take you in here as ordained we're just going to take you I wasn't even I mean I was a Christian but I'm saying I wasn't walking it out really. I was, it was a dark time, tough time that we were, we were going through uh, in our lives. But they just took me right in as ordained. 
Then the, the about five years or so went by and, and we found Open Bible. The Lord led us to Open Bible and Tom Rupley was, was the uh, regional director at that time. And you never get an answer to this. I sent an email. We just sent an email to Open Bible East. I don't know why even Open Bible East, not openbible.org, the national office. It just Open Bible East. He actually called me, said, let's have lunch together. We had lunch. We talked. Short time later, he brought me a stack of paperwork like this. And I said, I've, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> I just came out of that. I'm not going. And he said, well, let me, let's see if we can streamline it. And it went down to more like this. I said, okay, we can do that. And uh, he said, we're going to bring you in as ordained because that's what you were before. You were ordained before. Now, why am I sharing this? Because God called me to ministry, and no matter what I go through, and sometimes it's been dark, underneath it all is that hook, that call, that foundation. Now, I really don't think, now this seems bold, I, but I really don't think that anything can knock me out of ministry at this point in my life except for my own willful disobedience to walk away from God. I really don't think there's anything else that can do it. I really don't. You say, Pastor, why? Oh, you don't talk that. They'll get tested. Well, they might. I don't know. That's in God's hands. But the point is, look, some people can't get ordained in one organization. I've already been ordained in three of them. Are you following me? <laughs> And that call won't go anywhere. It won't go anywhere. Even when I wasn't, even when I was trying to leave the ministry and that organization uh, that I was over the group homes and stuff at, if they, they uh, at least once, maybe a couple times, had a funeral, you know who they came to for the funeral? <laughs> I'm not even a pastor right now. It's because when there's a call that's under there that came from God, and I have to acknowledge that call. Now, how good that is will have a lot to depend on my attitude. Can you say amen to that? But that call is still there. What I'm trying to get across to you is, is that when your faith is tested, you begin to rejoice in the fact. It's no longer a fear of the test, but you're rejoicing in the fact that you know that you know that while you don't want to face the hardship, but you know that you know that if you do, God's going to bring you through it. God's going to bring you through it. Come on, somebody. You don't know that until it's been tested. But you begin to rejoice and love and believe in the goodness of God. Now, the last thing on this aspect that uh, I want to touch on, oh, I keep going too quick, is that it receives, genuine faith begins to receive our future reward now in the present. Because it said there in those verses that we read, that we was going to be revealed. That basically, that, that you are going to get your recognition for true faith when Christ is, is revealed. So at the end of the day, our faith finds its fullness in heaven. But what we're experiencing right now is we are experiencing a withdrawal from our heavenly bank account. And I always try to explain this. Lord, give me grace to explain it. So uh, if Bob, if you pray, if you say, God, I need healing, and God heals your body. Poof, praise the Lord. God just healed you. What you've experienced is what's awaiting you in heaven. But you've made a withdrawal from the heavenly bank account, and it came into your life right now. Oh, man, I need a financial breakthrough. Well, there's going to be no financial problems in heaven for you. So when God brings the financial breakthrough, what happens is we're really withdrawing from eternity. The eternal treasures, and they're manifesting themselves now because all of that is in Christ. All of the promises of God in Him are yes and amen. Are you still with me? <laughs> all right, good. Praise the Lord. Because this is, this is important stuff. So... I already have it in eternity, but I'm believing God to receive it now. Now, I'm not, I hate to tell you this, because this doesn't sound like it's faith, but it, it is true. I'm not going to receive my full reward here. It's just not going to happen. I'm not going to receive my full financial reward, my full uh, health reward, my full relational reward. There's always going to be some things because the world's broken. And I still got part of me that's human, no matter how spiritual I get. All right? But when we believe God, and when we trust God... <laughs> He manifests Himself. The eternal manifests itself in the present. Amen? This is where, uh, I don't want to go over there right now, but in Deuteronomy, I think it's 33. I've referenced it several times lately, but underneath it all is the everlasting arms. 
when we hit the bottom, we're not really at the bottom as a Christian because there's the everlasting arms underneath us, holding us up. There, you're not going to go down any lower than the everlasting arms. Amen? God's going to hold you up. And, and uh, so we're receiving what is to come. Amen. So, very quickly, some of these points will go very quickly. Let's look at making my faith genuine, because we've just looked at what genuine faith is. Which, by the way, for the last several weeks at least, any of these things that I go so quick and you just want the notes... You just got to ask. I can get them to you. Notes or PowerPoint, I have those available. If there's something you just need to come back and look at, because I know that we do go quick through this. But well, how do we make faith genuine? How do I actually make my faith genuine? Uh, so let's look at some things that it is not and some things that it is. Let's go to the Word here in James 2.14. And... Uh, don't worry, I won't keep you all day. I'll just keep you a good part of it. And I'm not worried about this because we'll come back next week to finish anything we don't get to. That's the good thing about being a pastor. By the grace of God, you always got next week, right? As long as He gives you life. But let's go to James 2.14. And let's just read what the Scripture says. We're talking now. We, we saw what the elements of genuine faith are, and now let's look at how to make our faith genuine. James 2, 14 through 20. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled... But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, and you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So I want to just kind of start out on this point in verse number 20, where it says, Do you want to know, O oh man, that faith without works is dead? Because there's a lot of things that honestly we don't want to know. We say we want to know them, but we don't really want to know them. So uh, as we're leaving, there was a, was a book that I kept hearing about that I wanted to listen on, on the trip. It's called The Alchemist. Delaney didn't enjoy it too much, but Silas and I really enjoyed the book. It's not a Christian book, but there are, it's loaded with Christian principles. Uh, but it's about the journey of a young boy. I don't want to ruin the book. You should just get the book. It, it, it's loaded with good principles, but I'm just telling you it's not a Christian book, just so you understand that. But, but a, a lot of good truths are in there. So... I'm going to tell you some of it, but I don't want to run, run the book. The, the essence of the book is there's a boy that's been given a vision that he needs to go find a treasure. So in his pursuit to find the treasure, he comes across different people that he's met along the way. And in one particular case, in a place in northern Africa, he meets a man that is the seller of crystals. And this is a Muslim man that sells crystal wares and, and crystals and things like that. And so the boy hits it off with the guy that's selling the crystals. He starts to work for him. He uh, has lots of ideas. The business begins to prosper. So the boy's motive what the boy's motive was to raise the money needed to continue the journey. All right? But he's tempted. He's facing all kinds of temptations because now he has the money to go back to where he came from and all that. So he has to work through that and, and he has to overcome that so that he can take what he earned in the shop and continue the journey. But the, the moral of the story here in this particular segment is the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper was a Muslim man, and all Muslims have to make at least one journey to Mecca in their lifetimes if they are devout Muslims. And so the man started out from humble beginnings, and he decided, how am I ever going to raise the money to go to Mecca? So he started selling crystals. And he was an older man by this time, but his business prospered. His shop grew. And... I believe it comes to the point where he sells the shop and he gives the boys some money and he takes money. And so now the guy's, his dream has come true. 
He has plenty of money to go to Mecca. But do you think he's going to go to Mecca? He doesn't really want to go there. Even though that was what he claimed to be his motivating force behind all that he did, he just he tells the boy, you know that I'm not really going to go there. If I went there, I would be disappointed at what I found. Ooh, that may be a Muslim illustration, but that'll give you goosebumps if you think about it. Don't treat your faith that way. But a lot of times we do treat our faith that way. You know, we're saying, God, I want this. I need this so bad. If I only had this, this is what I need. God says it's yours. But then it's not what... It's not how we wanted it. So, so some of us, we know in our heart that it's not going to be how we want it. So we stay in this endless pursuit of something that we say that we, don't, that we want, but we don't really want. You know, uh, the Lord spoke to me, and I believe that He spoke to me that this place is going to grow. This church is going to grow. Can't we just have a revival? <laughs> Why do you guys got to work me so hard? I know I, I'm gone. I know I was gone a week, but you still work me hard. But it's a pleasure to work for the Lord and with you. But, Lord, why can't we just come in and have it just happen? Why do, we, why do you got to go through stuff for it to happen? Well, do we really want it? And again, I want to uh, adjust the motivations. And I, I want to be careful in this. The motivation is not to grow numerically, but it's spiritual growth, reaching souls, seeing God change lives. That's where the emphasis will forever be with me because that's what matters. The number of growth will go up and down and up and down and up and down. That's just how it's going to be. But uh, my point being, do we really want genuine faith? Because if we want our faith to be genuine, it will be tested. But after it's tested, it's going to become valuable to us. And we're going to be rejoicing in all the Lord, what, what the Lord has uh, done for us. Praise the Lord. Amen? The, the next uh, point here is that genuine faith... Is, is not just my words. I've already kind of touched on this, so I won't say much, but he says, what, is, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Our words are important, and speaking in faith is very important, but it's only like one brick in the wall. It's not like the whole building. We have to put action into our faith. Genuine action. So, when we were down at this conference, which uh, went well. And by the way, let me just stop and do a little public announcement here. The, the new president is Michael Nortoon. Josh will still be remaining in Open Bible East. Uh, I don't know. The, we, besides that, meeting him at the conference, I don't know the president. He seems like a super great guy. He's from California. Uh, but at this conference, the first leg of the journey for us was uh, the missions conference. Since I'm on the missions board now, and I don't know, Delaney thinks he might have just saw my name tag. I don't know if it was, uh, all, even though it's, I'm just fellowshipping with you right now, it does go with the sermon, don't worry. So, so uh, we're, we sat down, we went to a uh, buffet, an Asian buffet, I think it was the first night. And this, this bigger guy comes and he was alone because his wife, not everybody could get visas. She was still I like waiting for him in Amsterdam or something. He sits down by me and says, Velo! I said, hello, my name is Wolander, <laughs> Wolander. I'm not doing a brogue very good, am I? So he, he was from Ukraine. And uh, he said, uh, after this conference, I'm staying in the U.S. for a while, and I'm going to be in Ohio for a couple weeks. Uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pray about that. You know, I was just wanting to take it easy there at the beginning. But it, very quickly, I figured out who he was. He's the field director for Ukraine. He's over 40 churches. Basically, what Josh does in Open Bible East, that's what he is, but in Ukraine. Now, the other countries are not under the U.S., though they follow our advice and stuff. They're independent, just so you understand that. But So in Ukraine, you know what's going on there, right? There's war. And uh, Alexander shared with us that there's revival happening in Ukraine. And you'll hear him share this too because he's coming. But he said uh, now he has 300 visitors a week in his church. How would you like to have 300 new faces a week in this church? But you know what they are? They're war refugees. Because the men are staying to fight the war with Russia and the women and the children are moving further in away from the conflict. And he said uh, churches are being planted all over the place. His own daughter's planting a church in, I think, Amsterdam because she had to leave. You know, so, but he said it's the women that are planting the churches. 
Hey, women, you ready for a revival? Now, I hope that Russia don't attack us or China or something, but are you ready for a revival? How many of you think that their faith is really being tested in Ukraine? But it is being shown to be more precious than gold. And churches are starting, but it's women starting the churches because the men are fighting on the battlefield in Ukraine right now. Uh, so he, he's feeding about 300 refugees a week and overseeing the 40 churches in Ukraine. And, you know... Sometimes there are things, I'm just going to tell you, I, he's coming, he's coming on the 9th, because there are things that, you know, you just feel like you're not right with God if the guy's going to be right here and he's offering to come. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, can you, I, I, do not be guilted by this, do not be guilted by this, but understand this. If you woke up tomorrow morning and had to throw a bag on your back and leave everything you had, hmm, a lot of people in Ukraine are doing that yesterday and today and for like what a year and a half now however long the conflict's been going on so for him to be right here i said yes we got to receive him but i kind of said lord we can't just take care of this guy for two weeks but god opened up with a pastor in dayton that's going to take him and so we're just going to take him a couple nights and the guy's family's taking him in columbus but mark your calendars on the ninth sunday morning the ninth we're going to have alexander with us the field director of Ukraine, and also bring your checkbook that day. I'm not going to lie to you. We are going to bless this guy as powerfully as we can because uh, it's the right thing to do. It's just the right thing to do. So anyway, that just popped up here because genuine faith is not just my words, is it? It's my works. Now, uh, God's probably not calling us to go join the Ukraine army. But if we can help a pastor who's living it out, a pastor who's doing it, you know, then we need to do what we can. Don't be guilt, guilted. Always only do what the Holy Spirit tells you. And I'm serious about that. And I, I am completely serious. If the Holy Spirit only tells you a dollar, then you just put a dollar in. And you go home with a clean conscience. If the Holy Spirit tells you something more substantial, you listen to the Holy Spirit and do something more substantial. Can, you, can we agree on that? Okay. You will not be badgered by money. You will just be badgered to listen to the Holy Spirit. That's, that's how it works. But we can't just feel it. Oh, I have such... Com yeah, and th that's the next point. <laughs> it's not just my feelings. Oh, I feel such compassion for the Christians of Ukraine. Well, there's always opportunities to help. But literally, God brought the opportunity to help right to my table a couple days ago. Two nights in a row, Alexander sat with me and Delany at, at the various dinners and, and things that, that we were having. And uh, the Lord just put it all together, so he's coming. It's not just my feelings. There's an old story, I'm sure you've heard it, and it captures the sentiment that we have of the need is so great, we just can't do anything. But remember the old story of the kids that were walking down the beach and a girl kept picking up the starfishes, throwing them in, and her brother said, you're so dumb, there's thousands of starfish, you can't save them all. And she said, no, but I can save this one. She picked it up and she threw it in. Amen? We can't fix the war in Ukraine, but we can do something about this one pastor. Amen? It's not just how I feel about it. It's not just having compassion. Because there's all kinds of things that we feel compassion about. And just because, again, just because you feel compassion about it also doesn't always mean that it's what God wants you to do. Just because you felt something. Paul said, don't give under compulsion. Remember that? When he said, store up. So what you got now is you got like three weeks or something like that so that you're not given under compulsion. You can pray and, and I'm sure you're going to be touched when he comes, but you're not just going to be like, I'm given because I'm touched. You got three weeks to pray about it and hear what, God, hear what God wants you to do in it. We can't save them all, but we can do something for one. Genuine faith isn't just thinking about it. It's taking action. In verse 18, he said, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds, but show me your faith without deeds. I will show you my faith by what I do. So you need to understand that while faith is an invisible concept, at some point, if it is real, it will manifest itself. It will manifest itself. You know, people that are always talking about faith, but there's never any manifestation of faith, it's not real faith, I'm just going to tell you. Now, there are times when I may have faith for something, and maybe it doesn't quite come out how I'm expecting it, and it's a real faith. That's not what I'm talking about. But 
to live in this perpetual state of I'm just thinking about what I'm going to do for God. I'm thinking about when things get better, you know, when, when more finances come in, when, when a better opportunity comes in. That's not faith. Faith is picking up the one starfish at a time. Amen? I, I can't help every old woman in Maslin, but I can help this old woman in Maslin, right? And so, so you help them uh, as you can. And it's just as simple as that. Genuine faith is not just believing. In verse 219 it said, You believe that there is one God and that is good. Even the demons believe and shudder. So some years back, it's probably been eight, nine years back now, I was reading this passage of Scripture and God really spoke to me. I may not get it exactly how He said it, but He said, do you realize that, let me say it this way, if you have faith in God, congratulations, you're on the same level as a demon. Oh God, I got faith. Well, congratulations. As a matter of fact, the demons tremble. <laughs> When's the last time your faith in God made you tremble? You might have faith to be below the level of a demon. Watch out now. Huh? The demons believe and tremble. I mean, they're not going to obey Him, but they know who He is. Come on, somebody. So, just, just believing God is not faith. It's a key aspect of it. Again, it's another brick in the wall. But just because I believe God, and maybe my belief for Him is sincere, that doesn't make it faith. It becomes faith when I act upon it. When there's action attached to it. And it, it's just, there's no other way. You know, your faith can only do two things. Your faith can live or your faith can die. That's what it says. It's either alive or it's dead. There's no middle ground with faith. You know, it's, it, you cannot freeze dry your faith for a later day. You can't, you, know, you can't put plenty of ice in the cooler and keep it for tomorrow. Any more than they could store up the manna for the you know, two days, except for on the, the Sabbath, they only got manna every day at a, at a time. That's how our faith is. Now, there, there, are, there, there is uh, elements and residue from yesterday's faith, certainly. But our faith is either alive today or it's dead today. It's a daily choice to believe God and to act upon believing God. There's, there's no shortcut to that. And genuine faith is both my words and my actions. So it's bringing it together. That's what James tells us. That's what Peter was getting after here. You know, we're going to speak in faith, but then our actions are going to uh, come alongside of our faith. We're going to believe God that the church is going to grow, but our actions are going to come alongside of us, and we're going to do work days on the facilities as if we're believing God it's going to and we're, grow. And we're going to work on the sign, and we're going to work on the nursery, and we're going to work on, you know, whatever. When, when the fire marshal comes through and says, you got to fix stuff, ah, we fixed it, didn't we? He's a good guy. Hopefully he'll come to the concert, Dave. I hope that he will. Uh, Pam invited him, and I hope that he'll come. So, you know, you don't just say, condemn the building. You're going to fix it. Why? Because we really believe that God has a purpose. Now, we're talking physical facility, but the same way uh, with people. The same thing translates in into people. It's not just my work. It's my action. Because we believe it's going to grow, we're going to invest in people and in lives for that. So the foundation of my personal salvation is God's grace, but an evidence of my salvation is genuine faith. Again, it will manifest itself. I can talk all day about being saved, but there's going to at some point be evidence to my salvation that's going to manifest itself, that's going to prove that that, that faith is genuine. And Jesus saves. So at the end, it comes down uh, to God's, God's grace. So if you could stand for a moment.